Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Landscapes for Everyone. We're absolutely delighted to have you joining us here tonight. And I can see that numbers of participants are, are rising as, we, um, as you all join us. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself and then we'll start the evening. I'm Julia Aglenby. I'm professor in practice at the University of Cumbria at the Centre for National Parks and Protected Areas. So the Centre for National Parks and Protected Areas is a newly formed centre based at the Ambleside campus of the University of Cumbria. And its purpose is to foster cross-disciplinary research and to inform and influence policy making on the management of protected areas in the UK and further afield. And tomorrow we're holding a conference um, looking particularly at two aspects of the Glover Review which was the review into the national landscapes undertaken and commissioned by DEFRA last year. But this evening, we were really keen to have an open discussion where anybody who wanted to could come and consider issues around our landscapes. And we're delighted to have brought together a panel um, which is going to be hosted by Simon Yates. And we've got a really great panel who Simon will introduce this evening. But before we start, I'd like to just run a quick poll so I can still see that participants are coming in. Um, so it's lovely to have, have you all joining us. Um, so I'm going to run, run a quick poll. If you'd like to answer it, it'll come up on your screen. And I should just say that if you've got any, um, in terms of housekeeping, if you've got any questions um, about the technology, you can put them in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat as we go along and we'll get back to you if you've got any problems. It's good to see your answers coming in. We're having complaints from the panelists who want to vote too and they're excluded from the voting. So we'll just leave it for a little bit longer to run. If you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat, you're also very welcome to do that. And the ch just to explain, the chat is for putting general comments about the evening, about yourselves. If you want to say where you're from, we can get a feel for the range of um, people participating. If you'd like to ask a question to the panel this evening, then that's to be asked in the question and answer. So we won't be looking, at, we won't be drawing any questions from the chat. So please put your questions to the panelists in the question and answer. And you can find that it, it, the, on the, the menu bar on my screen, it's at the, at the bottom, sometimes it's at the top. So I'll just let this run for a little bit longer. We've still got a few votes coming in. We were hoping to hold this event in Ambleside just for those who want to know the history and we were going to be holding it in April. And we've... Um, we had to cancel it because of COVID. So we're really delighted by, by being able to hold it online. We'll be get, able to have a broader range of people attending. So here I've got, I'm a scientist from California. How about that? We wouldn't have had that if we were, um, if we were holding the event in Ampleside Church. It's absolutely brilliant to have, have you with us. So I think we've got 70% of people have voted. So I'm going to end the poll and I've got one more question before I hand over to Simon. So I'm going to share the results. Oh, we've got, many people have answered both questions. So everyone can see there, the number one is enjoy, people enjoy visiting national landscapes. So that was 91% and the top issue, ooh, it's kind of quite close. People interested in better recreation access to the countryside and nature um, and climate. So those are our top issues so far today. Now I'm going to hand over to Simon. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Julia. Um, right, uh, I'm going to start um, by uh, looking at the questions that, the, that, that we're hoping to explore um, tonight. Um, so we've got four questions. Uh, what are our national landscapes for? 
who benefits and who feels welcome to visit, enjoy and learn about these wonderful places. How to ensure all communities explore our most precious landscapes responsibly. And COVID-19 has enhanced the pressure on the Lake District and other protected landscapes. Can this pressure be managed sustainably? Um, we've got a load of themes uh, that we're going to explicitly allocate for questions. Um, you, you can put questions to any of the theme, any of the, any of these questions uh, through the Q and A box, um, and they'll be they'll be picked up, um, and some of those will be thread th uh, through to me and uh, and, and, the, and the panelists. Um, so that's that's how it's going to run. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists. Um, we've got, uh, fortunately, we've got one. We're one down at the moment, but hopefully they will be with us by the time we get to the uh, uh, we get to the stage of the the, the panel discussion. Um, so the first panelist I'd like to introduce to you is uh, Douglas Chalmers, uh, who is the chief executive um, of the landscape charity. Friends of the Lake District. Um, he's been that for five and a half years. Um, and the aims of, the, of that particular organisation are to protect and enhance the landscapes of the Lake District and Cumbria, uh, and then to engage and inspire people in landscapes. They're also a membership organisation with six and a half thousand members and own land throughout the county, including woodlands, a valley, and a working, a, a working farm common. Um, before this, Douglas was uh, Director North of the CLA, representing landowners and rural businesses for 14 years. And before that, he worked in the animal feed industry. So uh, that gives you a little bit of, uh, of the background of, uh, of Douglas and uh, the organisation he works for. Um, the next person I'd like to welcome is Mohammed Dalek. Um, and Mohammed is, uh, of this panel actually, is the, is the, is the only one that I know personally um, through uh, through. Uh, him doing various work with my wife. Um, but Mohammed uh, has a, a passion for the outdoors um, and lives in the Lake District, uh, lives in Cumbria. Um, and his passion uh, has also been for engaging black and ethnic minority uh, communities uh, to access the countryside uh, and outdoors. Um, He's had many different jobs and roles, but in 2019, he won a Churchill Fellowship um, and did research around uh, BAME and BIPOC engagement in the outdoors. Um, and for his research, he visited North America to explore their research, uh, approaches. Um, he's continued with that research back in the UK um, and is exploring a number of in initiatives uh, to engage BAME communities and, uh, and how the, uh, the sector engaged with race equality. Um, his current role, which I know he started quite recently, um, is, uh, is Equality, Diversion and Inclusion Manager with the Cumbria Fire and Rescue Service. Um, previously, he was manager of support for witnesses attending court in criminal trials across three uh, police areas, police force areas in the southwest of England. Um, and so, yes, uh, Mohammed's uh, had a lot of different uh, experiences and a lot of different jobs uh, over the years. Um, the next uh, panelist uh, I'd like to uh, uh, to welcome uh, is Dr. Anyana Katwa, um, and she is program manager for learning um, at the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site um, in Dorset. Um, so she um, studied earth science at Kingston University, um, and during her degree, became fascinated by the behaviour uh, and failure of sediments. Um, so she went on to study a PhD in geography at the University of Southampton. Um, her research examined how deforming sediments beneath glaciers contributed to fast ice flow. And she spent lots of time looking at glacial deposits in Iceland, Norfolk uh, and the Yorkshire coast. Um, she also spent four years working in the USA uh, as a postdoctoral uh, post researcher. Um, but it was a volunteer post in the US National Park Service that inspired her to move into public um, engagement and education. So she's worked for 15 years at the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site, developing and building learning programs that help people of all ages understand why this is a very special place. Um, I'd next like to uh, uh, welcome David Rennick. Um, he is the director uh, of the, uh, the, the Lottery the Heritage Fund um, for, for England, the north of England. And he joined the, the, the Lottery Heritage Fund in 2017. He was previously head of Yorkshire and the Humber. Um, he's been 
uh, Director of Conservation at the North York Moors National Park. Um, and in that role, he led the park's conservation work, including archaeology, nature conservation, land management, as well as rural development and grant giving. And David also led a number of not, uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund supported pro projects. Uh, David previously sat on the UK Bi Biodiversity Strategy Programme Board. Um, more locally, also sat on the York, Common North Yorkshire and East Riding Local Enterprises uh, Partnerships European Funding Committee. He's advised on funding decisions to support rural development and a range of other partnerships uh, covering catchment manager, flood and coastal rip management, as well as local um, uh, nature partnerships. Um, David's uh, from a, uh, an ecologist background with a BSc in environmental management and MSCs in uh, restoration ecology um, in, and public management. Um, so, yes, David has done a, uh, like all our panellists, done a, a wide variety of things. Um, the next panellist uh, is Debbie North, um, who we're struggling to get at the moment, but hopefully we'll have her soon. So um, in 2011, Debbie, a keen hill walker, was forced into early retirement with spinal degeneration. Since then, she has championed, championed the cause of accessibility in the countryside, making her mark quite literally in some places in the national parks around the UK and Germany. Her wheelchair adventures have led her to the summits of places such as Skiddaw, Blencathra and Cairngorm. She also pioneered an accessible coast-to-coast -coast trek from St Bees to Robinhood's Bay. Debbie's on a mission, making the inaccessible uh, accessible. So let's uh, hope Debbie is accessible to us all a bit later. All right. Um, my final uh, uh, panel member um, is Harriet Fraser. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her now. She is a writer by profession and works in con collaboration with her husband, Rob Fraser, uh, in their practice, Somewhere Nowhere. They use art, uh, research and documentary to explore the nature and culture of places. Over the past 10 years, they've done a number of projects here in Cumbria, including working alongside commoners and hill farmers, uh, and with ecologists, land managers and conservationists. They're both keen walkers and bring this into their work uh, with their own long distance walks and with guided walks that double up as opportunities to talk about land use, ecosystems, access and value systems. They've worked in partnership with organisations including, including the Lake District National Park, Friends of the Lake District, Farmer Network, Woodland Trust, University of Cumbria and National Trust. Um, they've also worked in schools across the county. Um, Harriet did a, an MPhil at Glasgow University, exploring the concept of cultural landscape from the perspective of commoners, embedding poetry into my research. Um, yeah, she's put here. Uh, she knows that sounds a little strange, but um, but anyway, we're going to have a bit of poetry now um, because uh, the uh, uh, the the clip of uh, film I'd now like to introduce uh, is. Um, is a Friends of the Lake District film, In Our Hands, uh, which uh, uh, was, was made, uh, I think, last year, actually, um, to, uh, uh, to celebrate. I can't, I can't exactly remember the number of years, but a certain number of years of the, <laughs> of the, uh, uh, of the Friends of the Lake District organisation. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to see that now. Uh, over to you, Julia, please. This is a place for the senses, here under a shared and wild sky. In the spread of hills and light. Laired with the conversations of wind and birds and waters fall.
This is a place for the senses. Land beneath your feet. Moss, bog and rock. Fresh fell air, the weather in your face. Let me take you on a journey. Through a raven's eyes, look on a world where hills are solid waves. And lakes spread, ink dark mirrors to the clouds. Coming close, the first leaf of spring. A butterfly or a bee? Busy among meadow flowers that turn to face the sun. Moments of wonder, lichen dressing oaks in grey. Dawn mist, carpeting a wood, an arc of colour after rain. In thousand valleys shaped by water, ice, time. Our own centuries are counting. In the endless march of handmade walls. <laughs> In coppiced woods and hefted flocks. In the quickening of hearts and the naming of things. <laughs> Textured land, common land, held by years of care and toil. A history of standing up. Mountain strong. Our farms in the fells. Tarns of the fells. Flora of the fells. And dedication to continue to ask, are we on the right road? In this fragile place. A woodland or a lake. knows nothing of uncertainty. Of shifting climates, or politics, or money. Nor does it know. The certainty of loss. How the will to protect what matters can outlast a raging storm. This is a place of London lives interwoven. Memory and hope, light and shade. It seems timeless, but time ticks on. And the future's in our hands. This is a place for imagining, for treading softly, for shaping and sharing what happens next. Yeah, it's a uh, it, it's a lovely film um, and a very nice uh, yeah very nice bit of poetry. So um, 
I'm going to uh, bring the panel in now um, to give their reflection on the film. Um, and Julia's, Julian Glover's challenge uh, that we need a stronger mission to connect all people uh, with our national landscapes. Um, I think now really that's touched uh, upon in that film and, uh, and the poems, but uh, the poem. Um, so um, I'd like to maybe um, ask Harriet first if she would like to just say a little more about um, about that poem and, and, and the film there. Hi, hi, thanks, thanks, Simon, and hello, everybody. Welcome to the evening. Um, yeah, it's always quite moving to see that film. Um, I wrote the poem, I was asked to write the poem for the 85th anniversary um, of the Friends of the Lake District. And my, I suppose my intention in writing the poem was to um, touch on the love that so many people feel for this landscape um, and, and its beauty and its fragility and how we really have a responsibility for what happens next. And, and that line about, are we on the right road, kind of really chimes with the Glover Review and looking at our landscapes in a different way. So um, unintentionally, there was a crossover. And I think, you know, everybody who's come along this evening um, and, and many more people besides are really aware that we really do need to change tack. So the Glover Review looked at uh, national landscapes, national parks and areas of natural beauty. Um, and if national parks were set up 70 years ago as breathing spaces for people, you know, what, what are they for now? And I think that's what the, the review is asking. Um, and I, I think that nature has been um, not overlooked, but needs to be put centre stage in how we manage our national parks, uh, whether we live here, work here, visit. Um, and it's, it's, a really good time to kind of shake up the conversation and introduce a lot of voices that aren't being heard. So um, I know there'll be a lot of chance through the evening to touch on on many different issues. So I, I won't go on too much, but um, I think that's me for now. Thank you. Um, I believe Julia's going to come back now with a with a with a poll, uh, another poll. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. And um, I also completely forgot to introduce Simon. Um, so um, this was a big, a big fault of mine. So Simon so beautifully introduced the panel and we're delighted Debbie's joined us um, now. So wave, wave from Debbie. Hello. <laughs> Hi Debbie. But I completely forgot to introduce um, Simon. So, um, Simon, like many of us, wears many hats and he's one of the most modest people you can come across. And he just said when everybody gave their little bios on the practice, he said, well, I'm just a member of the public. He said, I just like walking in the Lake District. And for most of us who know Simon, you know, they would think he's one of the most inspiring mountaineers and particularly explorers of adventurous places. Um, so. Um, he's also just brilliant at inspiring people. You know, my daughter's benefited, friends, his daughter going out. And you can find adventure. He encourages everyone to find adventure in places near them. So on a very personal level, he's absolutely brilliant at inspiring young people. He is one of the most famous and accomplished exploratory mountaineers of his time, while known um, for his um, harrowing expedition in um, touching the void, he now continues to climb the most remote and the most rarely explored mountain ranges of the world. And he's also an inspirational speaker and he takes guided walks, uh, type walks, mountain <laughs> climbs throughout, throughout the world. Um, so we're absolutely delighted to have, have Simon with us um, and that he's um, very generously given of his time this evening, as of all the other participants to enable this to be a, a free event, able to open to all. Um, I'm just going to have a poll just to get the, the, um, the attendees' reflections on the, on the um, film. So these are just random questions. Um, please don't, you know, if you don't want to answer the poll, that's fine. But if you do, just get a feeling, a gut reaction. When you watch that film, how did you feel afterwards? Um, so um, that 
is uh, uh, there we go. So I hope you can all see that. How did the film in our hands make you feel about the Lake District? Well, over half of you have voted so far. People have been very quick. Well, we've got to, um, I said when we get to we got to over seventy percent. So I'll given we've got lots to get through this evening. I'll I'll end the poll now and we can look at the results. So the most um, frequent thing was fond memories, sixty three percent. Must book another trip to the lakes. Would love to go, but there are some barriers. Seven percent, um, and um, then. One each of looks great, but not for me. I would love to go there, but I don't think I'll be welcome. So I'm now going to hand back to Simon um, and for him to continue getting feedback from the panel. Thank you, uh, Julia. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to um, I'd like to ask uh, other members of the of the panel to give their uh, uh, reflections uh, on the on the film. Um, and Julian uh, Glover's challenge that, that, that we mentioned earlier. So uh, who have I got next? Debbie. Uh, hello. Did, hello. Did you? I'm, I'm going to bring you in because you've been, uh, you, you've just come into, uh, you just joined us. So uh, thankfully, um, did you manage to see the film? <laughs> I did catch the end of the film, but I have seen it before. Right. I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. The visual and the words are just so powerful in evoking emotion and my disability is my mobility but I also work with an awful lot of other folk that have disability through sight and through hearing and something like that film really is a, such a powerful way representation of the Lake District and the kind of things that I'm often asked about is more film, more words, more footage for people who cannot access the countryside as many of us all can, as we can, but to hear it and to see it like that, that it's just wonderful um, how Terry has put it together and the poem, Harriet, just married together. It's perfect. Right, thanks. Thanks very much, Debbie. Uh, right, I'll go now to uh, to Mohammed. Why not? Let's, uh, uh, Mohammed. What 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 did you think of uh, uh, of the of the film and um, uh, and uh, the yeah the the stronger mission to connect all people uh, with our with our national landscapes? I think it's an interesting film. Beautifully made film. Beautiful poetry. But then when you look at the visuals, it sort of reminds me of what Glover talks about about that, that sort of rural idyll and, and the club, that it's the same people. In that whole film, we don't see much diversity. I don't think I saw anybody with a disability, visual disability. I think I only picked up two black Asian minority ethnic people. So it's about who are we appealing to in terms of attracting people to our landscapes? And I think we need to sort of really have a drastic change in terms of we approach if we want to connect with the people in this country, then we need to actually be, be, be sort of radical, be brave and do something different because we're almost appealing to the normal, pe normal sort of regular middle class white people. We're not appealing to those different audiences out there. So if we want to sort of attract more people in, then we need to actually change our marketing. What are our visuals? 
how are original portrayed? How, what, we, what am I looking at? I don't see myself in that video. I saw volunteers in there. I don't see myself in there. So if you want to get people engaged, then you actually need to be brave and do something different. Otherwise, we're seeing the same thing over and over and over again. And Jana, I think I'd like to bring you in now. Did you, did you feel the same way when you, when you saw that or did you pick up other things from it? I, I felt exactly the same way. And, and I, I mean, I, I live in rural Dorset, so I also live in a rural idyll. And, and having worked, um, I don't work anymore for the Jurassic Coast, but 15 years of trying to engage new audiences with World Heritage Sites is, is my history. And I think that's the points that Mohammed made are really, really important. This is a World Heritage Site. It has to appeal to a global audience. But the, the film was beautiful. It was a real crowd pleaser, you know, chocolate boxy kind of comforting nature about it. I love the landscapes, as you know, with my background in glaciology. Um, but for me, just if it had that additional element of diversity in it, whether it was diverse faces or diverse voices, or even I was thinking, wouldn't it have been beautiful for elements of the poetry to be spoken in different languages, whether it was in Urdu or Hindi or French or whatever it might be, it just adds a different dimension to, to how people relate to those landscapes. And perhaps even just featuring people in all sorts of different walks of life within the Lake District area. You, we could have heard from somebody who worked in a cafe or driving a taxi, as well as a, a wonderful fell runner. So for me, you know, the way we market a beautiful landscapes like this to attract new audiences in, um, we have to kind of change the narrative. And, and right now I, I work in museum spaces and trying to engage new audiences to actually be drawn into museum spaces. So I'm seeing <coughs> a similar challenge there, actually. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm on the same page as Mohammed. I, I am a great lover of the outdoors like Mohammed. I love walking and, and all, so, all sorts of outdoor activities. I didn't see myself represented and I didn't see my family represented. I have a blended family of all, you know, of different ethnicities, but, but I didn't feel like my own situation in my life was represented, even though it was a beautiful video. Thank you very much for that. And I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I said that you were still working for the Jurassic Coast. So what, what are you doing now? Just out of interest. <laughs> I work for the Wessex <coughs> Museums, uh, ah. which is a partnership and consortium of four museums. And I'm the engagement lead bringing in new audiences into those spaces. That's great. Um, right. I think we should hear from uh, Douglas Chalmers then, please, of the, uh, yeah, the Friends of the Lake District, um, um, the organisation that, that, that commissioned the, the film, I guess. So. Thanks, Simon. I'll, 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 I'll come back to those points, but to go back to your original question about the impressions of that film, and obviously I've seen it countless times and it, it always gets me and you always see something different. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and it's very easy to get carried away with the pictures because it allows you to focus on particular things that you could walk through the Lake District many, many times and never get the chance to see. But we have to remember that Harriet's poem came first and the pictures were fitted to that. So the words are very important. Uh, and everything really is in our hands. And, and the end of that poem is there is a place for it. This is a place for imagining, for treading softly, for shaping and sharing what happens next. And that's the crucial bit. And the other, the other line that Harriet mentioned, are we on the, on the right road? And the whole Glover uh, diverse, di diversity, bringing people into the countryside, it's getting more and more important. Before Glover, just before Glover was commissioned, we were asked by a number of parish councils down in the south of the county to do some work about extending the national park because they felt their landscape should be in the national park. And in doing that, I did a lot of background reading about when the national parks were created. And that's when you realise that was their original intention. It wasn't just about the landscape. It was about giving something back to the people, especially after seven years of of war. That's what the national bit in national parks and it's not nationalized, it's not public owned, it's 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 for the nation. And you could ask, is this a priority for the, the country now with all the other stuff that's going on? And they're probably more important than ever. They were doing that they started doing this in the 1942 and the, the depths of the, the Second World War. And we are coming through a, a period where the country is under a lot of stress, it's under economic stress, it's under health stress, people are desperately worried. And we know the huge benefits people could get from being part of, of these national landscapes. 
But that was all that was all three generations ago, and I feel that we've lost the excitement about national parks. Um, people have forgotten that what it was like before we had them, and I think if we got that excitement back, that would help, and we we could we could broaden it out to get a, a, a wider audience in. And I, and I hear all the comments that my other panelists have said. And, and yes, it's very easy to produce a film in retrospect. And, and I've, maybe I've got inside knowledge and I know, despite what it looked like, there was more diversity there than maybe uh, the casual viewer would see in terms of backgrounds and ages. Just, just trying to think of some of the faces there. There was everybody there from a, a van driver to a disc jockey. It wasn't all just retired teachers walking through the countryside. It was really diverse. There were people from New Zealand, there were people from America. Uh, it was just people who were there in the landscape. Uh, and that's what we tried to capitalise. So I think my message would be, let's get the excitement back about what it's like to be out there, get that into these new audiences, and then they'll cascade that excitement out amongst themselves. Uh, thank you. Uh, right, I'm going to uh, uh, get David in now, please. Um, I know we spoke uh, about a week ago on a, on a, on a you know, we had a, a, a Zoom meeting before this, um, and I know that you feel passionately about some of these issues, so uh, uh, it, it's your turn, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I sort of knew you were coming to me somehow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I, I guess I'm from working class Hull. I, I'm, I, I wasn't born in an area that had national parks on its doorstep. And I think probably I've been very lucky that I have had, I've had family members who can drag me out to the countryside. I had teachers and I had trips at school and, you know, and then I had, I had parents who sort of took me out. I think, I think if you're not, com if you're not comfortable getting out into these landscapes, they can be very daunting places. And I think that is a real contrast to what that film shows us. Uh, I think it, that said, it is inspiring. You know, the images are clearly uh, really engaging. And I think what it what it makes me feel is that I miss getting out into these landscapes as much as I, I normally would like to be able to. I'm very lucky. I've got the Hawardian Hills on my doorstep here where I live. The North York Moor is not very far away. And I was out on site uh, in an A and B uh, or a national landscape, if you like, uh, the the other day. And, and it just made me realise how much I miss getting really deep and not just in the landscape, but talking to the people who live in those landscapes. And I think giving, giving more people the opportunity to get into these landscapes is crucial. Interestingly, I watched the film a couple of days ago, and then I read the poem. And I think what's interesting about watching a film is we, we often get drawn into a film and we see what we want to see, or we see the issues and problems that we want to draw from it. So who's missing? Who's there? Which voices? If you read the poem, for me, that you you get a much more inspiring sense of what the, these landscapes can be for everybody. And if I just read the last four lines, which for me is is where we need to focus, this is a place for imagining, for treading softly, for shaping and sharing what happens next. And now that's what we're all here for tonight and tomorrow at the conference. And I think if it's that sense of hope and shared endeavour, we can go away from that film with then, you know, the future's ours to uh, to shape, isn't it? So, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Right. Well, I think it's uh, I think it's time, hopefully, for some for some questions to come through. But um, we've got themes here for questions. We're at, we're going to explicitly allocate time for questions from these themes. So this is uh, this is to everybody out there um, who's, who's 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 joined us and uh, uh, is watching this. So. A, uh, widening participation, race, class, economic depriv deprivation, disability. Um, B, nature versus farming may be framed as rewilding. Um, C, different types of uses of type of recreation. Um, for example, four wheel drive, tarmac cycle routes, zip wires, wild camping. Um, and finally, uh, D, um, COVID-19, I suppose, managing um, the increased numbers of people uh, that, we've, that we've seen coming into these national landscapes um, um, since, uh, since, the, since the pandemic uh, was, yeah, started and, uh, and people were able to, uh, to, to, to go to other places again. But obviously, they've been, um, uh, they're limited, really. Um, urban spaces are not particularly inviting to people at the moment, uh, 
with the COVID restrictions. Um, and obviously, um, international travel um, is, has been severely curtailed. So uh, those are the um, those are the themes uh, that that I'd like people to uh, to think about and really to 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 send it, you know, to to, to put in some questions, uh, please, so that we can uh, uh, we can move on from there. Hold on. I think we've got we've got something here. So, excuse me. I'm just I'm doing I'm getting questions on a, on a WhatsApp thing. And <laughs> All right. Um, uh, this is from somebody, uh, Fiona. It says, how can we better educate younger people uh, from urban areas to appreciate and respect the, the natural environment? Um, who would like to have a go at that? I think we'll do it this way around this time. It's, it's, <laughs> Is anybody going to, I'll go, I'm going to pick that. Okay, over to you, Mohammed. <laughs> I, think, I think somebody has just mentioned on the chat about field trips, geography field trips and residentials. If I go back to my school days, school residentials were a crucial part of growing up. And that gave you the opportunity to go out and experience. And a lot of local authorities have sold off their residential centres. So that whole aspect is missing. But I also think, I think, Locally, communities need to start thinking of different things of how do you engage young people locally in, 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 in the local environment, in the local parks, local nature reserves, and get them active through that way, and then slowly progress. In my, in my research last year, when I went to um, Canada and, and America, one of the things I saw was urban national parks, um, where you got people coming into, which was run by the National Park Service, both in Canada Parks Canada and the National Park Service in the U.S., but it allowed people to enjoy the parks locally in their cities before they went out to the wilder national parks. And I think that's something to really think about. And then more importantly, outreach work. Um, and, and it's what do the national parks and AONBs do actually around outreach? I know the Yorkshire Dells did a lot of outreach work with West Yorkshire. And I think it's about how do you get the staff out there into the communities engaging, explaining with the young people, with the communities to understand what the landscapes are about so they can then engage and come back. I, I sort of pop over to Yorkdales and the diversity I see in some of those areas, I think at one point I counted 70, 80% were of some different background, either Eastern European or different Black, Asian, minority ethnic background. And that was just sort of spending one afternoon in, in Malham. So I think there is a lot to say about outreach work, which I think it's really important. And then people like myself, I, I want to see myself in the park. How many rangers are there? How many volunteers are there that I can relate to? I think minute numbers, if any. And that's a huge challenge as well. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I've, I've got a little comment that's come in from somebody, somebody I know actually, who's, a, who's somebody who does a lot of, uh, a lot of things in, 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 the, in the community um, in and around uh, Penrith, but, but also in terms of the, of the, of the National Park. And, uh, um, and it, it's, it's a guy called Ronnie Kenyon. And um, he's, uh, what he said, what he said, uh, he's suggesting should, um, should country, countryside and nature be, in, be, a, be a subject in the, you know, something like this, be a subject um, in the national curriculum? So I think I will go to an, another person involved in education. Danyana, I'd like to go to you. I, I think Debbie's, put, I'll come to you. Yeah. After, Debbie, but, uh. so, so I was going to say there is a GCSE natural history in proposal at the moment. So that is currently gone to the government for a review. Uh, in terms of, I uh, just following on from Mohammed said about uh, young people in urban areas. I mean, there are several routes how you can start to engage young people in 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 how to how literally how to visit the countryside, and and you can do that through organised groups like Cubs or Scouts or Brownies. And actually, one of the biggest role models I think for the outdoor sector is the, is the scouting role model Dwayne Dwayne Fields. So he's worth following on Twitter. He's a young black man um, and he's done phenomenal work working with urban youth and getting them into the outdoors and understanding uh, kind of 
generating a conversation around behaviours within the outdoor spaces. Um, but Mohammed is absolutely right. I think I think national parks and AUNBs, um, you know, it's a big leap for a young person living in an urban space to then go to a huge outdoor space like that and understanding what the behavior should be. It's kind of, you're, you're almost taking baby steps to access those really beautiful iconic spaces. And you can either do that through school, you can do it through organized groups, or you could do it through communities um, within those urban spaces already. Um, so what we're doing in Dorset um, is, I, is our Dorset Race Equality Council, where I'm the vice chair, uh, our CEO now sits on the board of the Dorset AU and B. And so she's connecting communities with the AU, you know, the national landscape there. But what we're also trying to do is to look towards our communities that represent, you know, the voices of young people as well, particularly those in underserved backgrounds, to try to um, work with nature, cons nature conservation organisations to create that open pathway to learning about those behaviors. So it's, it's all about finding the right organizations that represent their voices and then creating open pathways for a discussion and a dialogue to happen. It's not about a blame culture, it's more about enabling and empowering those young people to make the right choices. Lovely, Th thanks for that. I, I know De Debbie's keen to come in here, so I'll, I'll, I'll let her. Yeah, uh, I will. Come in, I mean, <laughs> my, my background is in education and I always felt that the it's depending on who is leading the school and who is in the school depends on how much a child is immersed in the learning of being outdoors and having the respect and access to the beautiful countryside. There's some fantastic schemes though, and and you know like now we're in COVID, the the trips have are not happening, the children are not going on field trips, they're not going on day trips, residentials, but there are such good practices that are happening with the eco schools, where you've got fantastic examples of schools having gardens within their, um, their premises, in, within their grounds, and that doesn't, isn't just limited to, um, you know, the, their normal schools where I've got some ex fantastic examples of special schools that are getting the children with all kinds of learning disabilities, physical disabilities out into the gardens, learning to grow, learning about nature recognition, learning to enjoy the green space. And quite often that leads to pester power for the children saying to the parents, please can we go out a bit further afield. Um, and it is a shame that it is down to, in many circumstances, who is leading the school and the type of uh, staff that are within the school. Um, and, I, you know, there is a lot to be done, a lot to be done in education for the children. Oh, Harriet, you, you come in and have a word. You've not spoken for a little while. <laughs> hi, hi, thanks. Yeah, um, I'm really excited about the uh, Natural History GCSE in progress. Um, I've been watching that keenly. And, and Debbie, what you say, it really does depend in a school who is there to inspire the children and what level of skills that teachers have. And, and by skills, I also mean confidence with being outside. Um, I'm really inspired by the work of the National Forest in the Midlands and one of their, um, one of the things that has made it so successful, not just in regenerating the area, but also in working with people is in working with schools to help them use outdoor spaces. And I think not just within our protected or national landscapes, but everywhere um, to really try and build that in and upskill teachers as far as possible to use the outdoors as an integral part of daily education, just to re increase that connection in primary schools and then in secondary schools when the pressure begins to mount. So I'm a real advocate for that, however it can happen. Right, well, I've, I've, I've just got, uh, uh, some questions are coming in now and, uh, and uh, there's one here from- uh... Can I just come on on that one, please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and because it, it's fascinating watching this and, and where I'm sitting now, 
for the last 12, 13 years, my wife has been bringing people, all ages, all abilities, out into the countryside. And as we've had preschool, uh, care homes, people with dementia, autistic groups. The challenge has always been schools, getting schools out. And maybe that's another ask I saw in the chat, an ask for Glover, give schools the time and the money to come out into the countryside. The, the most successful run of school trips we had was when uh, a trust down in Knowsley paid for every primary school in Kirby, which is sort of uh, not the best bit of Liverpool. And those school children came up and they absolutely loved it. They engaged, they got the, what they were doing. I always remember the first question we got from a, from a child, do sheep have feelings? What a great question to come out into the countryside. And after they'd done all their running around and their pond dipping and their mini, beat hunt, mini beast hunts and their feeding the sheep, we have a little bench which looks out from the edge of the wood op over open countryside. At the end of every session, nobody told them to go there. Every group of young children just went there and sat and soaked everything in. And it was lovely to watch. So that would, that would be my ask. Help schools, give them time, give them money, let them come out and get engaged. Um, yeah, so, so the, thanks there. The, these questions, they're coming out and they're being, people are voting, they're, right, they're voting them up or down. So I'm going to take one from the top of the list. Or it, It's a point, really, um, which I think I'll, I, I think David will probably want to have a go at this one. Um, it says, as well as sharing our cultural, uh, our current national landscapes with a greater diversity of people, should we also develop and celebrate landscapes nearer to where most people live, especially those who cannot easily access nature. I know, Harriet, you were touching on that with the, the, the National Forest in, um, in, in the Midlands there. Um, but, but this is this question has come from Chris Lawrence. So um, I'm going to ask David to have a, a, have a, go, have a go at that, uh, please. Yeah, thanks very much. And it's funny because I was going to come in on the last question and I was going to say that I think ultimately it's great that we've got a natural history GCSE, but we need to get people. We need to get people young. We need to get people to really feel nature right from the the earliest memories that you can possibly have. And I think to do that, we've got we've got to get families. We've got to get kids exposed playing. I remember when I was a kid, I was out catching newts and putting them in a sink and messing around with mud and you know and and forest schools and things like that are brilliant, but there are far too new opportunities for for kids to feel like nature is theirs that they they can muck around they can break branches on trees don't quote me on saying that but you know we've got to be able to make mistakes fall fall over hurt ourselves that's how you get to be part of nature and creating nature on people's doorsteps rewilding the green belt pocket parks green spaces in every uh, housing estate all of that is absolutely essential if people get that, they will get national parks, they will get AOMBs, they'll want to get out and the rest will be easy. But if we don't get them young, then we, we just, we're just fighting against the, an end of pipe situation. We've got to get them right at the beginning of, of that journey, I would say. So absolutely, I believe that, you know, the likes of wildlife trusts, etc., working really hard in urban areas, uh, is crucial and I'm a trustee of uh, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust I must say so uh, I'm now experiencing that uh, more directly than I was before but I think I think I think yeah ult ultimately we've got to get people exposed to nature younger where they live and then they'll go on uh, to to value it and get out and, and, and enjoy the rest of the wider countryside. Okay um, who else would like to, uh, to to have a go at that now? Uh, Oh, I'll, I'll pick somebody then. And Yana, you, you, please, please have a, have a go. Uh, please, could you uh, take that question about uh, um, uh, about the uh, yeah, getting young people, getting people in, yeah, getting people to look at the landscapes where they are, really, maybe more, or or, or uh, rather than encourage, you know. Maybe it's a stepping stone to, to coming to coming into landscapes uh, like like Cumbria for, if you're from a, an urban area somewhere away. So, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Oh, is that me having that echo? And um, I think it's fascinating hearing about that initial spark that gives you that passion for nature and natural landscapes. I mean, 
I grew up in a very urban area. I grew up right in the middle of Slough, which is um, on the edge of London, so near Heathrow Airport. If you've ever flown out of Heathrow Airport, I had very little experience of nature growing up. Probably I, I, my experience of nature was a school playing field or just a local playing field, a local park. Um, it, but it was 12 years old when I went to visit my family in Kenya, in East Africa, which is where my family are from, walking across an ancient lava flow. And that was it for me. Those rocks basically made me want to understand the earth, study the history of the earth and become eventually a geologist and earth scientist. If every child in those urban spaces can have that aha moment, then, you, then you've almost like started that journey onto having a love for nature or having a love for science. It, it is so important to create those opportunities for children to, to open their eyes as to what's around them. I mean, whether that's kind of going with your, your parent or your carer to the bank on a Saturday morning and you're looking at fossils which are laid into you know, a piece of rock, you know, that makes up a stone in the building, or whether it's walking, you know, walking to the park or the library, and you're noticing the leaves falling off the trees in autumn, it, you don't necessarily need to have a handbook to know the name of every bird or, or to identify every leaf. But it's just encouraging our children and young people just just to look up, look up at the clouds in the sky. Sometimes that's enough to to cause a spark of inspiration to happen within that young mind and that young heart. Um, I think we, I think I see a lot of children when I'm out and about in towns and, you know, doing the shopping or whatever. And I often see children in prams, in buggies with a phone in front of their, you know, face that, that, you know, and I, you know, I'm guilty of that as well. Sometimes you're so exasperated. You're like, well, just play with my phone for five minutes. But it's, it's almost like what I used to do with my daughter when I was a single parent was I used to have a shoebox full of all sorts of natural materials like a leaf or a twig or a stone or a fossil or something. And sometimes I would just give her that to play with. And sometimes it's a simple thing. It, sometimes that is enough just to give a child something natural to hold in their hand like a pebble, a smooth pebble that you've picked up on a beach or a stream or wherever it might be in your garden. Sometimes just holding something simple like that which is interesting to capture their attention, even if it's for five minutes. Sometimes that's enough to raise curiosity about what nature is and discovering it in their own way. I think that's also really important is to allow children to have their own learning journey, if you like, um, and just to gently encourage and nurture that journey as much as you can as a parent or a carer. I think all of, those, all of that kind of self-discovery is, is really, really important. Lovely. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, if we could, uh, I, I see you want to come in, Harriet. Uh, if you if you could, that'd be great. Uh, I'm going to change the subject oh, quite oh, dramatically next because we've yeah, got a question that coming that, that's that's quite different to, to the the uh, uh, oh, you know, to this to this sort of thread we've been on now. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to quickly say that, and yeah, no, I really um, agree with everything you say, and I think then there's there's a place after wonder and curiosity to really honestly answer children's why questions because they always come. So why is this here as it is? And, and to be really honest about how we look after the landscapes that we have, how nature's evolved, what our part is in it, and all the different people that play a role in changing the environment in which we live for better or for worse. And I think that is part of the broader conversation. So to be honest and not romanticize all of our wonderful places and only sit in the beauty cat, um, category. You know, there's so much more to it. Well, thank you. That's, that's, uh, that's led me very nicely to where I wanted to go, actually, because we've got a question here from Rebecca Thomas, um, and it says, can farming change to manage the landscape for maximising biodiversity by those who understand their land they own while still making a living? Um, and I think I'm going to go to Douglas with that one first. What what does what are friends of the you know what what are the friends of the Lake District? What what's your sort of line on uh, on farming and uh, yeah, I suppose we we might be biodiversity rewilding, whatever you want to call it. Um, that that is, it's it's a really really good question um, because farmers are let's call them land managers because it covers everybody, people who are who are looking after the land. They're asked to do. Um, a wide range of, to produce a wide range of outcomes from a, a huge audience 
uh, some of whom are very informed, some of whom are less informed, and they all want their little bit. And the poor farmer or land manager who's in there probably wants to probably wants to deliver most of those things himself, but he's trying to run a business and he's trying to keep the roof over his, over his head and over his family. Um, a lot of the farming practices that we have at the minute, uh, even within our national landscapes, we have, and they've evolved over the last 40 years because of policy. Whatever your views on uh, originally the common market and then the EEC and the EU, it's policy that has driven uh, a lot of the land management um, uh, practices that we see now. And we're starting to see a little bit of a reaction back from that. And if you read, uh, for example, what James Rebanks is talking about in, in reading about now, he thinks that we've gone too far away from uh, farming, which is, I mean, I can remember it. The, the farm I grew up on was a very mixed, non-intensive farm. And that's, so that's, that's a generation ago. Uh, so we need to get back to that. But we have to remember that to do that, we have to put the systems in place and the policies in place. If we ask our farmers clearly enough what we expect of them, if we treat it as a true partnership, and as your questioner rightly says, they are the ones, they understand their land, they know how their, their land behave, how the soils behave, what happens when the wind and the rain comes this direction, what happens if they change that, that cropping over there, make them part of the partnership and make sure that there is some sort of income for there, whether it's from their commercial goods that they can sell, or we recognize the public goods that they're providing, that at the minute we all take for granted and, and we expect them to be there. We publicly consume them. We publicly get the benefits, whether it's the view, whether it's the, the sense of well-being, it's the, the, the clear water, the clear air. Everything is, is there. And um, sometimes they are produced for us by our current land managers, and sometimes it costs them to do that. So we need to be aware of that, make sure that the policy and the support for them allows them to produce what society as a whole needs, and we will get there. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to David. I, I, I don't know... Have you had any involvements with, I'm sure you have had involvements with projects to do with this, uh, this sort of thing. So I wonder what, uh, what, you, what your, your thoughts are on this, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've got experience of this from my previous role at the North York Moors National Park and also in funding projects in my current role. And I think, I think the answer has got to be yes, of course, we've got to be positive. We've got to believe uh, that it's possible. And more than that, I know it's possible because I've seen I've seen it. I've seen it happening, uh, and actually, you know, farmers f farmers on the whole want to do the right thing. Yes, they're in it to produce food often, and that is a you know, it's often a primary motive, and they're very proud about that, and so they should be. But I think ultimately, they also recognise. Uh, I mean, they're not daft. They recognise that there is a lot more that can be can be generated from farming, from land alongside uh, food. And I think particularly in national parks, national parks have been in existence for long enough. And even before that, I believe most farmers understand that but people benefit greatly from the landscapes that they care for. And there's a great deep pride, I think, in, in the majority of the farming community for, for, for a lot of those things. Now, there's obviously a, a spectrum about what we all want from the land. You know, some people will want a lot more from the land that, than farming delivers. And some farmers won't be comfortable with that, but some will. And I think what we've got to be able to do is firstly have a conversation. We've got to build trust. We've got to have dialogue and we've got to understand what we all want and need. Now, protected landscapes, national landscapes, give us the perfect opportunity to create this wonderful platform for debate about what we want. And if that's done in the right way, it should lead to really positive ways of achieving those things on the ground. And I, I, I remember working at the North York Moors, usually the first thing that we would do when we want to achieve something is go and talk to the landowner, go and talk to the people on the ground and, and understand what they know of the land. You might want to achieve, you know, re connecting up two habitats, but without that understanding that a landowner brings for that land that they know inside and out, as, as Douglas says, 
you are starting from a blind position. I think if you can then bring that uh, into the mix with expert opinion and knowledge, and you can do that through, you know, a conversation, not a diktat, then ultimately you can start to build that trust and you can start to, to get things happening. What I have to say is, though, that we also need to create a framework that 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 does when it needs to come down hard on issues, on 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 things that go wrong, on persecution, on poor management practice. On, on things that are robbing our future ultimately by not uh, thinking in the present uh, uh, in the present properly. So I think you've got to have that that good, honest, open, but it's got to be backed up with the right powers, and it's got to have the right agencies who have the right resources to work through that framework to to, to get. So it's carrot and stick, I think ultimately. But there are so many great examples already of of this happening. There are many in the Lake District. That we're aware of but all too often those great examples of of that sort of collaborative approach don't get celebrated and and we see the 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 divisive things getting put getting pushed and you can understand why but i think i think ultimately it is possible uh we've just got to find the right frameworks for making uh make it happen more often um i can see that you, you want to come in uh, harriet I, i'm just gonna i'm just gonna throw in another question here because it it, it leads on from this and you can you can you can uh, yeah uh, you can make your comments on the other thing, but you might want to have a think about this as well because it does lead on from this uh, the, the, that original farming question. It's um, Nash. It's from Graham Watson. National landscapes should have relevance to everyone, whether they live in them, visit them, or stay at home. Will this relevance only be realised when they are made demonstrably more successful at tackling the two biggest contemporary challenges which face everyone: loss of biodiversity. Uh, and the climate emergency. So that's yeah, that does it leads in it follows on really from that 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 initial um, uh, that initial farming question. Yeah, good, good question, Graham. Um, and yeah, thanks, David, for what you said. I just wanted to make an observation when Julia ran the poll at the beginning of this evening, and I can't remember what the first question was. I think it was why are you here? What are you interested in? One percent of the answers said farmer or farmers. And I don't know how many farmers are on this conversation, um, but I think integrating voices of all people, including farmers, is part of landscapes for everyone. So we need to look at how we have the dialogues, how inclusive they are, and how we sit in different camps um, and, and to stop polarized debates. So I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm not sure how many farmers are on here, but you know, declare yourselves in the chat. Um, that would be really interesting to me. Um, so Graham, your question was, can they only be landscapes for everyone when they show that they're tackling the problems of biodiversity decline and a changing climate or contributing to climate change? Um, firstly, I don't think it's fair to lay responsibility for those problems only in landscapes that are recognized as national or protected. Um, I think that, um, but protected and national landscapes really do need to stand up and have the spotlight shone on them about how they do look after nature and how they do take responsibility for actions that either contribute to or mitigate against climate change. So I think behaviour and consumer choices are really important as are landscape management decisions how ELMS, which is the new environmental land management scheme is brought in, how tourism is managed, what we do with that infrastructure, how we sell the places we live. And right at the beginning of the evening, somebody put in the chat about how people consume landscapes. And if that's how we want landscapes to be, as something we consume, then we're not going to be able to tackle the problems. So I'd like, you know, I think it's more about a partnership and sensitivity. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, right. Um, Debbie hasn't had us uh, uh, hasn't spoken for a little while, so maybe uh, do do you have any thoughts on the on on, on these sort of farming issues, Debbie? Um, I I have to declare ignorance about farming. I know nothing. Um, sorry, I, I I don't know what. I'm just really interesting. Would, would, you, would you like to say i'm just i'll just give you a question then would you like to see the landscape say 
remain broadly the same within you know within these these protected landscapes or or would you like to see them uh, re you know rewild more maybe become more forested or change or you know uh, um, well one of one of the things that I am noticing especially around the Yorkshire Dales uh, with more of the woodlands being uh, planted and the you know uh, forests grown one of the upsetting things for me is although I understand that the need for all the trees why are we still using the plastic tubings around the trees uh, nobody seems to be collecting them up as the the uh, bark you know as the, the, the tree trunks get too big for them they're just scattering the landscape surely there is a an alternative for them I think, yeah, I personally don't like those plastic tubes as well, I must admit. Um, but, um, yeah, we got, we've got, a, yes, this, this, this actually leads on to another question. I'm, I'm rattling through a few now because I'm, 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 I know that we've only got about another 15 minutes left. So um, it, this is somebody for, for, called Andy Butcher, and I, I, I quite like this question. It's, it's interesting because it's, it's, a it's a bit different. I'd like to bring this back down to earth. We don't have a problem attracting people. The place has been mobbed this year from all sections of society. We have three issues that need addressing. Littering, as Ron mentioned, fly camping and motorhomes. We do not have the resources to deal with the, the littering problem. So either we need to educate or increase the resources to deal with it, or perhaps both. Do we embrace camping away from campsites or enforce <laughs> restriction? Um, I know somebody because I, I was on the radio the other day with Mohammed. I know he has he has ideas on this, so I'd I'd like to bring in uh, uh, Mohammed now to, to to deal with that question, please. I suppose it, just sort of going over to the US, and I, I know this discussion has been had here as well. But paying to enter the park, um, the access to the facilities and the infrastructure you get, and I think. It's about how do we actually build that infrastructure? Or we're already paying for the parks through our taxes because they are natural parks and a contribution goes to that. But actually charging um, access to the infrastructure that's available um, so people can actually benefit from that, but also then it's managed and collated and the resources are there to ensure the facilities are there to encourage people. Because somebody mentioned earlier on about lack of infrastructure. Let's look at who actually developed the infrastructure for the national parks and AONBs, picnic benches, um, other facilities. They're all made, I'm guessing, by white men with nuclear families. So they're only made for four or five people. Now, if you look at some of the communities of color, and I, and I had these conversations out there in, in, in the US and Canada as well, they like to go in large families, extended families. I've been to Brockhole, I've been to Malham, and there are three or four generations coming together to have an afternoon out as a family. And I think we need to sort of respond to the, to the demographic changes in this country and in, in the users of the park and actually think about how best we do that. And I think it, it, was, it was a sort of that conversation we had, Simon, on at Brothers Water was about sort of provoking that discussion is, is do we need to charge an entrance fee? And OK, national parks are different in, 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 in North America to what they are here. Here they're living, working landscapes, whereas in the US they're very much wild. No, people don't live there. They're not worked on. So that there are a whole range of challenges. But it's something to think about in terms of how we respond to these, these challenges. And, and also there is an element of education for everybody here as well. Um, who, are, who are using our landscapes, particularly at this current time with, with the current lockdown and so on, in terms of are people aware of the, of the countryside code, leave no trace and so on? Okay. Um, I think I'll go to uh, Douglas again, please, just to have a, uh, some thoughts about that. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. There's, there's quite a lot in there. In terms of the... Um, just picking up Mohammed's point about charging, I'm, I'm not comfortable about charging people to come into the National Park. After all, they are parks for the nation. And as he says, they're not, um, as they are in other parts of the world, they're not wilderness, they're not in public ownership. They are owned by 
certainly the Lake District National Park, 40 odd percent is owned by individual farmers and landowners. Uh, and then you have your national trusts and your United Utilities and your Forestry Commission above that. So if we charge, I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure who you'd who you'd give the money to, maybe the Park Authority or the, or, or the Park Partnership. In terms of the other things that were spoken about, yeah, we don't, as, as if you look at um, visitor trends, we don't know what the figures will be this year, but over the last few years, we've had more and more visitors come into the Lake District every year. So people like what they're coming to see. So whatever you want to call it, the product, the offering seems to work. Instead of charging everybody to come into the park, what about charging um, some of the behaviours that we know causes damage to the park? And I know that before COVID, uh, on the back of a transport co uh, conference we, we, we ran, there was a lot of talk coming back about charging um, visitors' cars. So you weren't penalising locals or businesses, but you could turn road charging on and off depending on how busy it was which road it was and you think of how busy some of the roads have been even the last few weekends uh try to try and encourage people out of cars into other modes of transport now we have to be realistic and people are very cautious about public transport at the moment but i think we have to bear in mind that once we get this once we come out of this strange times or once public uh transport providers sort of work out how we can get back onto buses and trains safely, I think maybe that's one of the ways we can try and control behaviour by specific charging. Uh, and education, obviously another thing, it, it's been very clear over the, the last few weeks and months that there's um, a huge gap in the understanding of the countryside code by many people and respecting where they are and, and who they're with. So again, there's a bit of enforcement, but if you enforce, if you pick up litter behind people, they'll just come back and pick it again. We've got to get in its source. And again, it's, it's some of the work we're doing with Keep Britain Tidy. We're looking at uh, why people litter and how we can change their behaviour to try and deal with this before it even happens. Um, yeah, uh, would anybody else like to, uh, uh, to have a comment about David? Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, I think... I think clearly it is an issue. I think we've seen we've seen it in probably all all of our national parks uh, in the last few months. I think for me, you know, COVID has given us a real sense of reflection. You know, what 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 is it that motivates these people to come to national parks when they they probably haven't been before? Maybe escaping the public gaze, maybe gathering, you know, and breaking all the regulations. But maybe just maybe there is an attraction to get out into a landscape and and do something in with a wild backdrop. You know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I'm naive, but I do think also we we should reflect on the amount of resource it takes to deal with these incidents, and we should probably reflect on the the lack of resource that maybe protected landscapes have. And I think the on, honest thing is that protected landscape authorities, national park authorities, AOMBs, often have this expectation that they will deal with everything. And the reality is they, they don't ha always have the powers to deal with everything in their areas. And I think sometimes, you know, local authorities and others who do have powers maybe feel because it's in a national park, it's all the National Park Authority's role. And I think there's got to be much more compelling sort of incentive for, for some of those public bodies to get stuff in and do stuff in national parks to actually make the national park the best it possibly can be. So I, I would say we probably need a bit more resource from a wider range of people with the wider range of powers to deal with some of this. But let's but let's educate, let's let's engage with the people who are visiting. Let's try and turn them into advocates for the for the future before we uh, we lose this opportunity, I would say. Um, OK, I think um, uh, Julia's keen for me to a uh, ask uh, a another question uh, before we, because we, we're, we're running towards the towards the end. And uh, I think she's got a poll as well, isn't she? A final poll for us to uh, have a look at. So, um, but I'm going to go with this, uh, this question. So how do we keep our new visitors who are more diverse since COVID coming back once the restrictions are lifted and they can do whatever they did before? And that's a question from Dale's Catherine Kemp. Indeed, yes, some of the people um, I'm sure have come to the Lake District this summer would perhaps be have, have got on a plane and gone to Magaluf or whatever, have not they? You know, um, so, but um, yeah, that, I think that's an interesting question. And uh, I'll go to Anyana, please, because you've uh, you've not had a word for a, for a while now. Ooh. 
sorry, I was just trying to get myself off mute. I, I think that is a fascinating question. Uh, so I live in Dorset, obviously. We've got the Jurassic Coast. We've got the Dorset AUND uh, within the county itself. Now, we saw huge numbers of people. You would have seen it on the news um, at Durdle Door. You know, vast numbers of people coming down to enjoy the beaches at Bournemouth and, and Dorset. Now, what was really interesting for me was the the type of people that were coming because these were people I believe who were absolutely new to protected landscapes and to be honest I was delighted to see the sheer level of interest in our British landscape and our coastline with this sector with this audience um, in this country obviously I saw the litter I saw I saw the crowds I saw the traffic and inside me it was like this bittersweet moment it was like I'm so pleased you came you know, we have been working for 15 years to, to help you to see how beautiful this landscape is. Now, our job as kind of advocates for nature, managers of these protected landscapes, we need to do a better job to help those audiences understand how to enjoy nature and respect uh, that landscape. So, so the question is, is how do we pass on the knowledge that we have to those audiences, whether it's through advocates and role models, like we talked about Dwayne earlier on, whether it's through influencers on YouTube. I mean, it's we've got to go where these audiences are and where they are consuming the information in order to, to get those messages out there. If we, if we stay within our comfort zone of protected landscapes and the channels that we occupy, like, and I, I hate to say this, Country File is a lovely program, but it speaks to a certain audience. We need to almost move our messaging to where our audiences are, where those new audiences are. And I do a lot of work looking at content development and how to get messages effectively out, particularly to children and young people. I mean, to be honest, I would say hook up with really big characters within those uh, spheres, within those spaces. And I think it's creating partnerships um, to provide platform for those influences to talk influencers to talk to their followers because it is the, their followers who are literally our new audiences coming into our spaces so we need to work with those role models to ensure our messages are getting out to the communities um, who would benefit from them the most uh, thanks for that um debbie um have have you noted more noticed more people with disabilities say coming into the um uh, into the into this the, the, the national park since uh, since the since the covid uh, pandemic I, I haven't i haven't seen more people with disability but i have received more emails from people with disability wanting to know how they access the countryside um and it's really interesting in the the type of walks, the type of areas that are people wanting to experience um, from people who have got the limited mobility where they're just wanting um, a, a shorter walk and wanting to know where they can have uh, maybe half a mile walk and experience a stunning and wonderful view to people who want to experience the higher, the longer, the more challenging walks and wanting to know the routes that are, are available. Um, and what I noticed from a, per, from a disability point of view is the varying uh, degrees of information there are within the different AOMBs and the national parks whether it be the miles without styles or the easy access routes. And then you have people's ignorance of, of what it is that people with disabilities are, are wanting. Um, and you can got the whole argument of, are we wanting to concrete the UK with paths for wheelchair users, which is absolutely, no, that is not the case. Um, we're wanting to look at the type of technology that is available for people with disabilities to access the countryside. Um, we're wanting to look at not only the, the mobility side of it, we're wanting to look at all the other kind of disabilities, like I said, right at the beginning from, from the, 
the emotions that the, the film evoked for the, the sight impairment, the hearing impairment. You've got people who need the quiet space for the, the autism. You want dementia friendly. And it's the way that the parks and the AOMBs and the landscapes present that information to people who are wanting to find out how they can access the countryside and that we are creating a countryside for everyone to enjoy. Um, very varied. I could speak about it for, forever because obviously it is a, a huge passion that, that I have. Um, and we need to get the next generation of people with disabilities engaging in the countryside. Um, Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Debbie. I'm sorry to cut you off a bit there, no, but we're, we're no. running out of time. And you've actually you've actually just answered the last question as well. I'd like to ask, and this is just a, a quick one to to everybody on the on the panel. Um, could he, this is from Rachel Hewitt. Could each member of the panel identify one key factor that encourages access for a particular demographic, and one factor that hinders access? And Yana, you're 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 first on my screen, so uh, uh, please you have a kick. Yeah, it's the so final, I, I, the final thing. This so hinders access. I think. I think one thing, and I'm please speaking from a perspective of a Black and Asian person. Um, one thing that hinders access is a fear of meeting hostility and racism within those rural environments. And and I've experienced that. And I've I know when I've talked to others um, who are Black or Asian in these rural spaces, they have also experienced that. One way we overcome that barrier is to embed absolutely effective training with um, all members of staff from right from board and trustee level down to front, front of house staff about how to welcome people of colour into our natural spaces and once we start changing the mindset about in terms of unconscious bias and microaggressions we actually start to change how people feel within our rural spaces so those are two things I'm actively working on. Okay, uh, David, your, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I mean, I think listening is a much underrated skill and I think uh, empathy alongside that. So I'd say those are, those are two things that we need to do much more of. Listening, understanding, empathising and then, and then acting on, on those things that we hear. Uh, so I, th I think that as a ge as a general approach is a, is a good thing. I think good quality, easy to understand, tailored information about basic things about how to access landscapes is of is often missing. Uh, because actually, I don't. I, I think it's easy for for those who are familiar with accessing these landscapes to forget that actually knowing the basics of of how things work, where can I go, how can I have a simple walk, all those kind of things I think uh, could be very, very, uh, could, could be done much better. But, but empathy, listening, reaching out, understanding, overcoming those barriers and being active in that process would be something I would, I, I would advocate for. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Douglas, <laughs> what, uh, what do you think uh, encourages access or hinders it? Both, I think um, what hinders it is, is expectations. And I've, I've, I said for many, many years, I was not excited to visit the, the Lake District. I had to come here and see it for myself to be to have my socks wowed off. Uh, so I think we have to make sure that the expectations that we put out, um, uh, a, a lot of the media stuff about uh, natural landscapes and uh, national landscapes have been negative over the last few months. That's not going to help people to come. We want to get all the good news stories out. And when everybody everybody who's taken the time to, to plumb into this webinar tonight, we are the enthusiasts. We should be passing on that enthusiasm, that excitement, and making it obvious to absolutely everybody that they can come here and they can get the, the, the joy and the fun and the excitement that we all get from it. Thank you very much. Um, Harriet, what... what what would you think uh, would encourage access um, One and, and a factor that hinders access for people coming um, uh, into, these, uh, into these landscapes? I think um, sometimes there's an assumption made all too easily that everybody wants to come and it appeals to everyone. And, you know, you might 
get somebody coming out for a walk for the first time and go, well, yeah, so why, now what do I do? Or I, I've met people on the fells and they go, well, there's nothing, nothing to see there. You know, so th there's quite a long uh, process, I think, of storytelling and it comes back to education through, through books, through Twitter, through TikTok, through Instagram, through schools, whatever it is, to make the experience a real experience and something that lots of different people, whatever their background or ability level or culture, can find something in from that for them. So it's about seeing relevant role models and, and learning stories from other people. Um, we're all different, we all get something different from it, but, but where are the stories and where are the examples out there? So I think that's maybe an opportunity for, for telling a much broader range of stories about how different people can access special places and that doesn't have to be only within national landscapes. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, to finish with Mohammed, please. Um, if we could have, uh, if you could share your uh, your thoughts on uh, on, on yeah. access to these special places. So, what hinders access? And I'm going to go back to Glover and a paragraph he wrote around diversity. And he wrote, "And we have found interest rather than a burning desire to change. When we have discussed diversity, it was rarely raised by those we met. This is unsurprising, as we set out later. The lack of diversity among those governing bodies looking after our national landscapes is extremely narrow. They are almost all white, almost all male, and many are retired. It's not, a surprise, it's not surprising that priorities can seem alien to many when we can, so, so basically what he's saying is, we've got to change the governance of our organizations, both voluntary sector and the public sector and OMBs, because unless we change that from the top, we've got a group of people who don't understand what's happening in this country at the moment. And we're not gonna change unless that change happens from the top. What will make things better and what will encourage access, the positive side, I think we need to do a lot more outreach work, but also look at what's, look at, look at Cumbria and Lake District. There's a whole black history within Cumbria that nobody knows about. How many of the organizations in Cumbria are celebrating the black history that's there in, in Cumbria? There's slavery, but there's a whole range of other stuff. First black settlement in the UK in Cumbria, first black police officer in Cumbria. So let's actually celebrate that to actually encourage people to come in. So there's a lot to celebrate and we need to have those conversations and difficult conversations around race and engagement at the top of those organizations because that's the only way we're gonna change. If we're gonna be scared of having those conversations, we're not gonna change. It's no point putting up a, blank, a black screen to say you're supporting Black Lives Matters. When I go behind those organizations and look at their websites and what they're doing, they're not doing anything. So let's get real, have those real conversations with people and then engage with those communities. There's lots of work, go work going on across both the lakes, the Yorksdales, the Peak Districts, Brecon Beacons, North Wales. Let's actually have those conversations and get more people coming into our landscapes. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, there's a, a lot of food for thought there. Um, so I think it just uh, uh, falls to me to wind it all up, really. Um, thank you to all our panellists um, and, and thank you to all who joined us on the webinar for, for coming along and, uh, and, your, and your questions. I'm sorry um, we couldn't deal with, uh, with all of them. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've enjoyed this and I'll, I'll leave you with a little random thought of my own. That apparently the government spend a billion pounds a year just clearing up rubbish off motorways. Um, Rubbish is a national issue now. Uh, they could spend 100 million pound on an advertising campaign, couldn't they? And to stop that and scoop that back straight away, I would think. Um, but that's my little tiny little thought for the evening. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, um, thanks to Julia and um, Debbie who've organised all of this. And uh, I don't know if, if Julia wants to come back in now. Um, well, but, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And I think a huge thanks to Simon. I know from having done this myself, running a Zoom webinar and keeping on top of everything is unbelievably exhausting and focused. And I think we'll say um, his uh, uh, glamorous assistant, Jane, is uh, 
Joe, you're going to make he's, a cameo. He's doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it really does require a lot of teamwork. So thanks to our tech team behind the scenes, to Carrie, who set everything up, um, to Hannah and to Susie, and, and a big thank you to our panellists and to our attendees. The chat is absolutely brilliant. We've saved all the chat. We've got the Q&A. Um, and a um, and the Centre for National Parks and Protected Areas is a very new kid on the block, and we're just um, testing different ways of, of engaging with people. And I just got a final um, quick um, poll to ask whether you'd like any more of these sorts of events. Um, so this is a sort of public um, outreach work where we bring lots of people together, open to all. So if you could just ask this question, and um, none of us, of course, will be offended if we don't get the answer we want, but we'll... Uh, um uh i'm uh, sorry it doesn't it should have said um to host more of these type of events um so this is would you like the center for national parks and protected areas to host more of these type of events you're getting good feedback simon good <laughs> We appreciate it's really hard to answer all the questions and what would also, if you want to put anything in the chat about how long you would like these events to do, we've tried, be, we've tried to stick pretty much to time to keep it to an hour and a half, but um, you know maybe we need to do more shorter ones. If you've got any views on that, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, it's CNPPA underscore UOC, then please um, uh, do. Um, and we put in most of the, I put all the um, Twitter, um, links for the panelists as well are on a tweet. Um, they're tagged into a tweet um, today, so you can follow them as well and then um, engage with them. So, um, so thank you very much to everybody. Big thank you to Simon. We can't really do a round um, uh, of applause very easily, but we can do some claps. Um, and for um, those of you who are coming uh, tomorrow, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, but do get in touch with us. Um, we'd love to hear from you about your ideas. And so I think on that note, goodbye, everybody. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. Good night. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good evening.